Hi, this lesson is about maximum and minimum values. Extreme values are maximum and minimum values. The plural for extreme values is extrema, and the singular is to say extremum. The process of finding extreme values is called optimization. Extrema can be found either on the domain of a function or on an interval within the domain of the function. We have different type of extrema. We have absolute extrema and local extrema. Synonyms for absolute extrema would be to say universal or global uh, extrema. So we can have absolute, universal, or global maximums or minimum uh, values. So here are the definitions. If, if C is an element on an interval within the domain, f of c is considered to be the absolute minimum of f of x on the interval if f of c is less than or equal to f of x for all x within that interval. So in other words, f of c must be the smallest value, the smallest y value overall within the function. And the reason why it's less than or equal to is because you could have more than one absolute minimum value. Um, and then, on the contrary, for C in I, it's considered to be an absolute maximum, F of C is an absolute maximum of F of X, as long as F of C is greater than or equal to F of X. So F of C must be the largest value or less than or equal to the largest value. You could have more than one absolute maximum. Um, when no interval I is mentioned, you just assume that you are discussing your uh, extreme values over the domain. Um, so then we have our local extrema. Synonym for local is to say relative. You can have relative maximums and relative minimum values. Um, so a function f of x is considered to be a local minimum at x equal to c if f of c is the minimum value of f on some open interval within the domain, that open interval is important there, where c is somewhere within that open interval. So um, it doesn't have to be the lowest point overall, but it is a low point um, on your graph uh, at c, as long as c is defined on an open interval. So there have to be values to the left and right of c um, in order for this these local minimums to exist. Um, you could have a local minimum that's also an absolute minimum, um, but that only happens when it is within the interval. And it is the lowest, not just the local minimum, you could also have an absolute minimum, and I'll show examples of this. Um, a function f of x has a local maximum at x equal to c, if f of c is the maximum value of f on some open interval within the domain, again, there's that open interval part, where c is somewhere in that open interval. So in this case, f of c will be a high point. It doesn't have to be the highest point, but it will be a high point on the graph. All right, so here are two examples, one in blue, one in, blue, one in green. So here's your continuous function f of x defined on uh, the interval from A to B. C is a special point. This is considered to be a local minimum because at C I have this point, which is a low point, although not the lowest one overall on the graph, but to the left and right of C, F of C would be considered to be the lowest point um, on that small interval. D is also impor an important point at D I not only have a high point, but I also have the highest point. So D is defined on an open interval to the left and right of this, um, of this graph. So it qualifies as a local maximum, but it is also an absolute maximum because there is nothing greater than F of D on this graph. Um, and then we have B. B is at an end point, so it is not defined on an open interval. So it can't be a local extrema, but it is the lowest point overall. So it, it is, in this case, the absolute minimum of the graph. So you can have absolute 
maximums or minimums either at the endpoints or within the graph. But for local extrema, they have to be uh, within the graph, not at the endpoints, because at endpoints, those um, values would not be defined on that open interval that we talked about. Um, so let's look at the green one here on the right. Um, here I have several values that I need to pay attention to. This graph is defined from A to E, where A and E are your endpoints. B is a high point on the graph, but it is not the highest one overall, so that's just a local maximum. Then we go to C. C is a low point. It is a local minimum because it's C is defined within the interval from A to E. Um, and it is defined on a small interval to the right and left of C. But it is also the lowest point overall on the graph. So at C, I have both a local and a minimum um, and, and a, a minimum value. I'm sorry, a local and an absolute minimum value. And at D, um, D is a, a local and an absolute maximum. When I'm at D, not only is that a high point on a small interval around D, so that, that's what makes it a local max, but F of D is also the greatest value overall on this, on this graph. So F of D is um, also an absolute maximum. A and E aren't anything special. Um, they are endpoints, so they can't be local extrema. And in terms of absolute, A and E are neither one is, is the highest or the lowest value overall uh, on the graph. So their function values are not the greatest or the, or the least values on the graph. Okay, so here's a theorem associated with this topic. This is called the extreme value theorem. Um, if F is continuous on a closed interval from A to B, then F attains an absolute maximum value uh, F of C and an absolute minimum value F of D for some value C and D in the interval from A to B. So they could be inside of the interval or C and D could be either A or B. So when you have a closed interval, you will obtain absolute max and an absolute minimum uh, value. Um, okay, so let's talk about this. So we want to determine all extrema on the graph of y equals x squared on the closed interval from negative 2 to 1. So the extreme value theorem can be applied to this because x squared is a continuous function as stated here. We're defining it on a closed interval from negative 2 to 1. So we should be able to identify an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum value. All right, so it is helpful to graph x squared from negative 2 to 1. So at negative 2, uh, x squared is 4. At 1, x squared is 1. And because it's a parabola, you want to show the vertex on this as long as that vertex falls somewhere inside that interval, and it does because the vertex is at 0, 0. So you can see that 0, 0 is both an absolute and a local minimum, but that the first endpoint at negative 2, 4 is my absolute maximum. There is no local maximum on this graph. So in other words, this point isn't anything special. All right, so there's your extreme value theorem. We did find an absolute max and an absolute min value. Here we have determinal extreme values on the graph of y equals negative 3x plus 1 on the open interval from 0 to 2. Well, we can't use the extreme value theorem to make any assumptions here. Although this is continuous, it's a line, it's defined on an open interval, so we might not have any extreme values. And in fact, if you graph this, if you plug in 0, you're going to have an open circle at 0, 1. And if you plug in 2 in here, you're going to have an open circle at 2, negative 5. 
So they're really, this graph never a, a, attains its highest value or its smallest value. So this is an example of something with no, um, with no extrema. Now, if this had changed to zero to two, then this point would have been colored in and this point would have been colored in. they would have been closed. And I would have a max here and a min here, and they would have been absolute, not local because they're at the endpoints. Um, but that's if it changes, if it changed to a closed interval, then the extreme value theorem would apply. Okay, here's another theorem. If f of c is a local maximum or a local minimum, then the value c is considered to be a critical point. We find critical points by solving f prime of x equal to zero. But not all critical points are, are solutions to this equation of f prime of x equal to zero. We might also find critical points at restrictions on the domain of f of x or restrictions on f prime of x. So not they can't all be solved like this. Sometimes we need, need to take other things into consideration. All right, so here we want to identify extrema and critical points if they exist for f of x equal to x cubed on the closed interval from negative one to one. All right, well, f of x equal to x cubed um, is a continuous function. It's a polynomial. It's defined on a closed interval. So we know we're gonna find extreme values, um, but let's see how our derivative can help us find that. Um, so we can try solving f prime equal to zero as, as this uh, states that we should. Um, so if I do the derivative of x cubed is three x squared, set that equal to zero, you get x is equal to zero. Um, but when x is equal to zero, y is equal to zero. Um, you can also plug in the endpoints negative one and one when uh, x is negative one, y or f of x is negative one when x is one, y is one. So graphing x cubed from negative one to one looks like this somewhat stretched out S shape. So you can see that zero, zero is nothing special um, in terms of extreme values, but it is called an inflection point, which we'll talk about later in the course. It will be important in terms of the graph, but it is not, um, it does not represent an extreme value. In fact, we have an absolute minimum at negative one, uh, negative one, and an absolute maximum at one, one. Okay, so let's move on. Here again, we want to identify extrema and um, critical points if they exist on the interval from negative one to two for uh, f of x equal to one minus x minus one to the two thirds power. So in terms of a radicals, radical, this is a, um, a root of three. So um, you can take cube roots of negative numbers. So really there are no restrictions on the domain. So this is continuous and it's defined on a closed interval. So I will be able to identify a maximum and a minimum uh, value at, um, on this graph extrema. So let's see if our critical points will help us as well. So I'm gonna let f prime of x equal to negative two thirds x minus one to the negative one third um, equal to zero. So um, if I solve this equal to zero, I get, um, so let's see, uh, f of one for this function f, oh, when you solve this uh, equal to zero, you really can't solve it because this ends up in the denominator. This is equal to negative two over x minus one to the one third power. This would never equal zero. The only way it could equal zero is if the numerator is zero and that's not possible because um, it's a constant of negative two. 
So there are no um, values here that I could solve for, but I know I do know that one is a critical point because at one, this f prime of x is undefined because then I would have division by zero, which means that one could potentially be an important value on the original function, which does have one in the domain. So if I were to evaluate my two end values, negative one and two, as well as my critical value, I get the function values that you see here. F of negative one is negative 0.59. Uh, f of 1, which is the critical point, is 1, and f of 2 is 0. So if you graph those three points, it looks, um, it looks like this. Uh, remember, this is what we call a kink, which means that's where the derivative does not exist. And so we know that it does not exist at 1. It would be undefined there. Uh, but the function does. So... Um, that means I have an absolute minimum at negative 1, negative 0.59, this one right here. I have a local and an absolute maximum at 1, 1, which is the blue point, and the point 2, 0 isn't anything special regarding extreme values. Okay, so here we're going to sketch a graph that satisfies the following conditions for f of x. So you want to show that f of x is continuous on the closed interval from 1 to 5. We want to show that there is an absolute minimum at x equal to 2. We want to show there's an absolute maximum at x equal to 3 and a local minimum at 4. So remember, uh, at 4 you have a minimum, but you also do at 2. But the one at 2 must be lower on the graph than the one at 4. So um, the placement of your graph doesn't really matter much. You could be in quadrants one and four the way I am here on the right. Everything could be in quadrant one, everything should be in, or everything could be in quadrant four. But the general shape should look a lot like what I drew here. Because again, you need to show it's defined from one to five. So you need closed points at the beginning and at the end. You need an absolute minimum at two. So that is the lowest point overall, an absolute maximum at three, that's the greatest point overall, and another minimum at four, but it's only a local. So um, it's a low point at four, but it's not the lowest one overall. Okay, here we want to find the critical points for the function f of x equal to x over x squared plus one. Remember, to find critical points, we set the derivative equal to zero. To find the derivative here, I need quotient rule. So I did g f prime minus f g prime all over g squared. So when you multiply, you get x squared plus one minus two x squared over x squared plus one to the second. Simplifying gives me negative x squared plus one over x squared plus one to the second. So whenever you're solving a rational expression uh, for zero, you're really just solving the numerator. And as long as the solution is in the domain, um, it's a good solution. So I can ignore this denominator and just solve the numerator because my denominator has no restrictions. This, the domain here would be all real numbers. This would never equal zero. So I have negative x squared plus one equals zero. Um, if you move the x squared uh, to the other side, I only wrote it left to right, but that means x squared is equal to one. Take the square root of both sides, you get x is plus or minus one. So that means I have critical points at negative one and one. Now we'd have to do more testing and checking to see if they represent maximums or minimums, but this answers the question of what the critical points are. All right, so here's another one. We want to find all critical points for g of theta equal to sine squared of 18 theta. Remember, this is another way to uh, rewrite that function. So sine of 18 theta, the whole entire function is raised to the second power. And that actually helps when taking the derivative because we have to take the derivative and set it equal to zero. 
So when I look at it from this perspective, I'm going to use chain rule. The squared is the outer, the sine is the middle, and 18 theta is the inner function. And with chain rule, you start on the outside. So my derivative will be 2 sine of 18 theta, that's the outer function, times the derivative of the middle function cosine of 18 theta, times the derivative of the innermost function, 18 theta is just 18. So when I multiply the 2 and the 18, so this and this, I get that this is equal to 36 18 theta cosine theta. All right, so um, rather than try to solve this, where this equation where I have two trig functions, I'm going to use the double angle formula to rewrite it as a single trig function. So this is our double angle formula. That 2 sine of theta cosine of theta is equal to sine of 2 theta. This is why it's called double angle, because it's twice the angle uh, than what you have on the left. Okay, so, um, so from here, I go to here, okay? So here, my 2 becomes a coefficient of 1, so it's half of it. So my 36 here becomes an 18 here as a coefficient. My angles here become twice the angle with sine. So my angles here were 18, twice that is 36 which is why I get sine of 36 theta there. So now I can solve this equation and set it equal to zero, and I'm only dealing with one trigonometric function instead of two. Okay, so divide both sides by 18, you get sine of 36 theta equals zero. Okay, so now we need to remember uh, information that we learned in trigonometry we know that sine of theta equals zero at these values, at zero, pi, two pi, etc. So the general way to say that is sine of theta equals zero when theta is equal to pi k for k equal to an integer. What's an integer? It's numbers like negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. So you don't have frac fractions or um, decimals inside your integers. Um, but I don't need to know what theta is. I need to know what theta, just theta, I need to know what theta needs to be when I have 36 theta. So what value of theta would make 36 theta equal to pi k? Well, divide both sides by 36, you have critical points at pi over 36 times k. And that represents infinitely many critical points. Um, so with trigonometry, sometimes um, you'll have to write it in general terms the way we did here. All right, that's it for this lesson. Give the homework a try. Good luck.